All right, everybody should have gotten a notification that the recording has started. All right, uh, I'm really excited to tell you all about the contents of my thesis. The title of my thesis and this talk is Wearable Haptic Devices for Social and Virtual Interaction. Haptics allows us to communicate information through touch. And unlike other sensory channels like audio and vision, haptics isn't as overwhelmed by information. It also allows us to communicate information discreetly. And that's part of what has enabled the popularity of uh, different wearable technologies such as the Apple Watch. And as virtual reality and augmented reality become more popular, it also will allow us to interact with virtual objects and virtual environments. And this is useful for a variety of applications such as social interaction, where uh, that's especially pertinent during this social distancing time. It's also very useful for virtual and augmented reality, as I mentioned previously, and for teleoperation and training. Haptics means relating to the sense of touch. And we receive haptic feedback using two main methods, kinesthetic haptic feedback and cutaneous haptic feedback. Kinesthetic feedback uh, is sensed by our muscles and joints. And generally it's created by forces that are generated by user movement. And we also have cutaneous feedback, which is sensed by our skin and tactile mechanoreceptors. And those allow us to feel different sensations such as texture, slip, vibration, pressure, and skin, skin stretch. And these haptic feedback mechanisms come into play in even the most simple of interactions, like picking up a glass of water. We feel the weight of the glass in our muscles and joints as we pick it up. And we also feel the skin stretch and normal force on our finger pads as we touch the glass. Researchers have investigated ways to replicate both kinesthetic and cutaneous forces using various devices. There's also uh, advent of research in wearable devices. Traditionally, researchers have investigated desktop devices where the grounding is provided by a tabletop. Uh, however, these inhibit user movement. Currently, researchers are starting to investigate wearable devices as an alternative. And with these wearable devices, what we see is the grounding move closer to the area that's being stimulated or receiving haptic feedback. So in this example of a wearable device, we see now the grounding has moved from the tabletop to the back of the user fin user's finger where they're receiving stimulation on the finger pad. So when we have wearable devices, that means we are limiting the amount of kinesthetic forces we're able to provide because we're no longer able to stimulate across joints. So throughout this presentation, I'm going to be focusing primarily on cutaneous wearable devices. There are various fingertip displays. They're able to provide uh, normal force, normal and lateral force, and researchers are even starting to look at the applying forces in all directions, as well as torques in all directions to the finger pad. However, one thing to observe is that as the number of degrees of freedom of these devices increases, their size and complexity increases as well. Researchers have also investigated body-mounted tactile displays. And these displays can deliver various types of cutaneous forces. For example, the device shown by uh, Janello and company is able to deliver shear forces at four different contact locations around the wrist. The device by Moriyama and company can deliver a shear and normal force at two locations at the top and the bottom of the wrist, as well as shear forces at both location. Researchers have also investigated various arrays of actuators that are able to stimulate uh, using both normal shear vibration forces. Uh, they've looked at locations that aren't just the forearm, but also the back uh, and the face, as well as others. And these types of wearable displays are really useful for various applications such as social touch. And I think what makes this uh, particularly interesting for social touch is the finding that these discrete sets of actuators can actually be used to create continuous sensations. And what I mean by that is if we look at this device by uh, Colbertson and all, and then this device that I created uh, with Cara Nunes, um, we have the, uh, an array of actuators. So we have six actuators um, in the image on the left, and then we have five in the image in the center. 
However, we found that we could deliver continuous stroking sensations using both normal force and skin slip. Uh, this enables us to be able to virtually communicate different social touch interactions. So the main challenge is that as we uh, have more applications for haptics, such as virtual reality, uh, we are asked to create more compelling and realistic haptic feedback. And one way that we can do this is by communicating more information. And we can communicate more information using uh, three different methods. We can increase the number of contact points, we could increase the information content of the signals that we're sending, or we can increase the degrees of freedom of the devices to make them more realistic and interactions more realistic. So throughout this presentation, I'm gonna talk to you about three projects that I've worked on that focus on these three ways of increasing information. I'm gonna discuss a body mounted haptic display that increases the number of contact points. I'm going to talk about a data driven method for creating meaningful information. And I'm going to talk about methods for creating a multi-degree of freedom wearable devices that are affordable and scalable. Let's get started with the first contribution. Classically, researchers have investigated fingertip displays because the glabrous skin of the fingertips has the densest number of mechanoreceptors or touch sensors. Researchers have also looked at forearm displays because that leaves the hands free for various manipulation tasks, but the user can still receive haptic feedback to the area where the device is located. Uh, researchers have also looked at body mounted, dis or sorry, excuse me, <laughs> Um, what we are proposing is a body mounted display for the fingertips. And so what we want to do is we want to mount the device to a location on the body, in this case, the forearm. And then the user is able to reach down with their contralateral hand and explore the display. And so this means that we can stimulate the forearm uh, independently, and then we can stimulate both the forearm and the fingertips together. This has various use cases. It can be used for human robot, human agent, or human human interaction. And it's especially useful in environments where audio and visual channels are saturated or for private communication. So for example, in a industrial or a factory setting where uh, somebody is tasked to use their hands to move around uh, different objects, this can be useful for providing information about the, and giving feedback on their performance. So now that we have this paradigm, we're interested in asking two questions. The first is, is there a difference in performance between a body mounted fingertip display and a fingertip only display? And the reason we're asking this question is because there are different ways that uh, there could be some interference occurring during stimulation of, of uh, using a body mounted display. Um, and this is because of the phenomenon called masking, where when users receive simultaneous haptic feedback to locations that are close to each other, it can reduce the overall perception. We're also interested in looking at whether simultaneously stimulating the fingertips and forearm is different from stimulating the forearm only. Uh, we think that uh, the forearm will perform worse than the fingertips and forearm because the forearm is so much less sensitive than the fingertips. However, we want to quantify exactly what the difference is between these two conditions. To do this, we implemented a user study where we focus primarily on vibrotactile haptic feedback because it's a well-studied stu form of haptic feedback in the literature. We mounted two different actuators to various locations on the body. We looked at the fingertips only the forearm only and the fingertips and forearm together. We varied the vibration amplitudes to 1.5 Gs, 3 Gs and 6 Gs of acceleration. And we performed this experiment on 18 subjects who each performed 432 trials each. The task that they were asked to perform was to identify signals from a set of 16 different signals. And these signals were designed to carry four bits of information Consequently, there are 16 signals. The way that the signals work is that uh, they are uh, two simultaneous signals sent to the two actuators that are composed of pulse trains. So in this example, 
here, um, we see that uh, actuator one receives two pulses and actuator two receives four pulses. And each actuator can receive a minimum of one pulse or a maximum of four pulses. And a maximum of four pulses can occur within a one second period. We chose these pulses or rhythms because they've been shown in the literature to be noticeable and distinguishable. Uh, here we have the set of 16 signals so that you can see what they look like. Here are the results from the first user study. Along the x-axis, we have the amplitude, and along the y-axis, we have the accuracy. The accuracy is the number of uh, instances that the user got correct over the total number of uh, instances they received for that condition. And the main takeaway here is that the fingertips and form is only lower than the fingertips at low amplitudes. Additionally, we see that the forum condition is lower for all amplitudes as we expected. However, we're able to quantify exactly what the improvement of performance is um, for when we incorporate the fingertips in our display without having to increase the power or amplitude of the actuators. Now that we've answered this question, um, we, these questions we're interested in asking a third and that's, does the relationship between the fingertips only fingertips and form and form condition change as the task becomes more difficult. And we use the number of signals as a proxy for task difficulty. And we looked at a, a total set of 25 signals and divided those into four subsets, one of four, nine, 16, and 25 signals. To get the 25 signals, we now allowed a maximum number of pulses of five pulses. We performed this user study with 12 participants who each uh, participated in 810 trials. Here are the results from the second user study. We see the along the x-axis the number of signals and along the y-axis is the accuracy. Once again, that's num the number of correct instances divided by the total number of instances for that condition. We have the different conditions in different colors. We see here that the fingertips and form and the fingertips only conditions are not statistically significantly different for any of the number of signals. And we find that the forearm is statistically significantly different from all other conditions, um, which follows the logic from the previous study. Another way to interpret this data is to take this raw data and look at it as a amount of information transfer. So we can calculate the IT estimate in bits, which is shown in this graph. Along the x-axis, we still have the number of signals. Also plotted here is in a dashed black line, the maximum number of bits that's possible given the number of signals that is being sent. And what we see is that with this set of signals, we're, as we increase the number of signals, despite the fact that the accuracy is decreasing, we do see an increase in the information transfer. However, it's not um, reaching the maximum uh, information transfer that's possible, indicating that we might have a plateau between three and four bits. We created a wearable display to demonstrate how this device could be used. Uh, this display is uh, wearable and can be resized to fit various forearms. It's composed of two virotactile actuators that are the same ones that were used in the user studies. We can send a control signal to the actuators, which then provides haptic feedback to the user. And then the user can reach down and touch capacitive touch sensors, which are mounted to the actuators in order to replay the signals. And this demonstrates a way that the device could be used as a platform. And we used it in various educational displays in the lab where we were able to show people the sensitivity differences between the forearm and the fingertip. In this section, I contributed to the design and testing of a body mounted wearable display. And I implemented the two user studies to demonstrate the efficacy of the display. Now I'm gonna talk about a way to create meaningful information using a data-driven method. So the main driving question is, can emotions be recorded and replayed on a haptic device using a data-driven pipeline? And the reason why we wanna ask this question is because classically researchers have designed uh, haptic signals uh, 
using hand tuning methods or through user studies where participants generate um, a set of signals. But generally it requires a mapping between the signals and the emotion that's trying to be communicated. However, we wanted to create uh, meaningful signals without having to require uh, any training. So to do this, we focused on collecting emotion data in a user study. We focused on six different scenarios, attention, gratitude, happiness, calming, love, and sadness. And um, the participants were either couples and close friends. They would sit together and receive an audio prompt. Um, after the audio prompt uh, was complete, they were asked to reach down and uh, touch the arm of the other individual. And the arm of the other individual was mounted with a pressure sleeve, which could record the touch interaction. After the, uh, after the study was complete, they conducted a survey to determine their conviction and comfort while delivering the different touch instances. The sensor sleeve that was used is a pressure sleeve um, and it has no active actuation. It simply can record the pressures that were delivered um, by the other user. And there were two different sizes, one with 120 cell cells and one with 142 cells. So the data we record is a pressure array with different values indicating the amount of pressure that's being applied. So um, there is an example here of a of raw data frame of the device. The sensor can record pressure as high as three PSI uh, at about 20 Hertz. We're able to collect uh, 661 different raw signals from 37 subjects. And um, overall, we had 534 signals that were above the noise floor. To validate this data set, we wanted to transfer this information to a haptic device. And we wanted to create an algorithm that would work on any haptic device that was composed of any number of actuators of different sizes. However, we had to select a specific haptic device in which to validate our, our data set. So we chose this haptic device, which is composed of eight different voice coil actuators. Each of the voice coil actuators can deliver normal force um, and it, at each of the eight contact points where they're located. To create the signals for the haptic device, we first took the recordings, we looked at the raw data, we performed a Gaussian blur on the data, and then we performed a multi-object tracking algorithm that's seen in computer vision. So the algorithm works by identifying uh, common points between frames, so in this case, we see that it's identified the uh, red dot as an area of interest. Then we can generate a signal for the haptic device. So in this case, we see these three actuators turn on, which indicates uh, a specific rendering for the haptic device and a translation of the voice coils, which relates to the amount of pressure that they're able to apply. And we track this point throughout time between frames, and we see a corresponding uh, movement of the main contact area that corresponds to the movement of the point in, that is being tracked. And this corresponds to a stroking motion. So we see the movement of the red dot along the frame. We can do a similar, uh, a similar process for a squeeze. So uh, we find in this case, multiple objects of interest and we track them between frames. And we see uh, the corresponding displacement of the actuators that is then rendered to the device. When displaying the signals to the haptic device, there are four phases. It begins with the actuators pulling back from the arm so that they can move their full displacement. Here we see the example stroke. Um, so it moves along the length. Now we have a squeeze where both sides of the device move. Then it resets to its initial position. For this validation study, we performed an experiment with 30 subjects who had not part participated in the previous study. The subjects heard audio that corresponded with the six different scenarios. 
And they felt all of the signals without knowledge of which corresponded to each emotion. And they received after that three repetitions of all six of the haptic signals. And they input their responses using slider bars, which represented their certainty. So in this example, we see that the user thought that sadness was the most likely candidate and then calming and then love. We require that one scenario be ranked higher than all of the others. To select exactly which of the signals we were going to deliver to the haptic device, we used a neural network to classify the recordings. And each of the 534 signal candidates received a score. Uh, and the six highest scoring instances per scenario were selected. That means we have six uh, of the highest scoring for each of the six uh, emotion instances resulting in 36 can signal candidates. Uh, the six were narrowed down to one by choosing an emotion that contained expression strategies that humans can understand well. So we tallied the different expression strategies. An example of an expression strategy for attention is tapping. Here are the results. Um, we found that during our experiment, we were able to achieve an accuracy of 45%. We can compare, compare this to a study that was performed by Hauser and Company in 2019, which used similar emotions. And they, received, they were able to have a human-human accuracy of 57%. Um, we see uh, in these images, confusion matrices of the different interactions. And they show us that attention and happiness performed the best during our experiment, which is similar to what Hauser and company found as well. Another method that uh, or metric we use to look at these emotions and how users understand them, understood them is to look at and measure the uh, motion response using the arousal and valence uh, plot. So arousal and valence is a 2D mapping of emotion. And what we find is that the medians for sadness, calming, and happiness exist in the same quadrants as in previous literature. This indicates to us that um, we're actually able to send the emotional content that we intended. And what's sort of interesting when we look at this plot as well is that we see some differences uh, compared to our accuracy data. For example, in this space, attention and happiness are quite close to each other, which could be because um, attention is uh, um, usually done with a tap or a poke, and happiness, you, people tended to convey it by shaking the arm. So both of those uh, had some high frequency content. Comparatively, uh, sadness is quite different in this space, and this provides a different way for us to look at and understand the data that we collected. Overall, in this uh, section, I did this work in collaboration with many individuals, and my main contributions were to the design of the two user studies and the data analysis and statistics. Now I'm going to discuss a method for creating multi-degree of freedom wearable haptic devices that we hope will enable the creation of more uh, accessible and scalable fingertip technology. There are many different types of joints that you can have in a robotic system. There's rotational, prismatic, universal, and spherical. And what we notice is that as you increase the number of degrees of freedom of these joints and you increase the number of joints you have in a system, that tends to increase the complexity and cost. So the driving question is, can we design a four degree of freedom haptic device that is easily reproducible and simple to manufacture? And the way that we wanted to approach this is by looking at origami or foldable robotics. Origami manufacturing for robotics is an up and coming field and it introduces new mechanisms such as bending, torsion, lateral bending, shear, compression, and elongation. And it enables some really interesting uh, technology. So the premise is that you start with a, a flat 2D sheet that is then folded into a 3D geometry. And in this case, we have uh, um, the first image shows an inspirational image where it shows how much of a deformation or change in 3D shape you're able to get with an origami device. In the center, there's a or origami um, device that, that is able to jump and move around. It has onboard actuation and sensing. 
And um, a basic thing that we're able to create with this origami uh, structure is a hinge joint. And to explain how that works is um, we can have a thicker, more rigid area of the origami structure and then a more flexible material. So the more rigid material in this case is shown in gray and the more flexible material is shown in orange. And by having this uh, change in stiffness, we're able to create a hinge or a rotation about the flexible material. Using these principles, we created a four degree of freedom haptic device for the fingertip. This device is able to move along the X direction, the Y direction and Z direction, and then also twist along the Z direction. We see here the tactor or the end effector of the device, which is the area that interacts with the fingertip. The finger is mounted to the device with a finger mount and then the finger is Velcroed in place. The motors are mounted to the base and are what trans translate the end effector position. The device itself is quite lightweight. It's about 45 grams, um, but when we attach it to the motor base, uh, that's where the majority of the weight is located and the weight of the motors and the wires and the base itself. Um, the motors are connected to the legs using a four bar linkage, which translates the rotation of the motors to rotation of the legs. Here is a video of the robot in motion. We see it moving along the X axis, and then it's going to move along the Y axis, the Z, and then finally it's going to twist. And you'll notice there are various markers in this image, and that's what we use to track the position of the robot as it moved for our bandwidth and various tests. To create this device, we used uh, origami manufacturing process, and the fabrication process is very similar to fabrication methods seen in PCB design. How it works is you laser cut layers, um, and you laser cut out the areas that you want to have your joints in the more rigid material. So in this case, that's the fiberglass, which is shown in a pale white. Um, we have our more flexible material, which is the Kapton shown in orange. And you'll notice that doesn't have the area where we want the joints to be cut out. We also have the adhesive. In this case, we're using a dry adhesive that melts and binds the layers together at high heat. We have a bonding stage next where we stack all of the layers and we apply pressure at high heat in order to fuse all of the layers together. Now we laser cut once again and we release our desired shape. So in this case, we have an origami leg with a three degree of freedom joint at its center. We can use this technique now to expand it to the uh, fabrication device type process for our four degree of freedom device. The traveling plate here is shown zoomed in. This traveling plate is composed of 17 different layers of fiberglass or FR4 and adhesive. Um, all of the layers are shown here, both flat and stacked. We can see that there's a parallel bar linkage and this linkage or this parallel, sorry, this parallelogram um, is shown here in layers three through five and 11 through 13. Um, and this uh, parallelogram structure is attached to the rest of the device using one millimeter dowel pins. The tactor is shown here in layer 17 and that's what interfaces directly with the skin. Here are the different layers of the leg. Um, each of the four legs is composed of 17 different layers. In this case, we do have a Kapton layer, which is used for the hinge joints. Once again, we have a parallelogram um, and you can see it in layers three through five and 11 through 13. Um, and it is also connected to the rest of the device using one millimeter dowel pins. Unlike your traditional robot arm, we solve the kinematics for a parallel mechanism by looking at the kinematic chain for each leg independently. And when we do this, it results in a system of four equations. So here we have a mapping between the traveling plate and the legs and then their corresponding kinematic variables. 
And to give a brief overview of how we solve the kinematics is we can look at the kinematic chain for each of the legs. So if we look at leg one, for example, we start at the origin in the center of the device. We go to P1, and then we go up the leg to A1. Then we go up again to B1, which connects to the traveling plate. We can go to C1 and then to D, and then back to the origin. And this leads to a summation of vectors. And now that we know this relationship, we can also observe that the magnitude of the vector AI, BI, for each of the legs is equal to the length of the leg, which is known because it's a physical system. So now that we have this relationship, we can rewrite these equations to find a relationship between the leg angles, which are what we're able to control, and the end effector position, x, y, z, and theta. This results in this following equation. I don't anticipate you to uh, completely understand the equation right off the bat, but I'd just like you to notice that it has um, the tactor position or end effector position, x, y, and z. And then we have this vector dBi, which is different for each of the legs, but is dependent on theta. And then we have the leg angle angles qi here in this vector. We can now use this equation to solve the inverse kinematics and the forward kinematics. The inverse kinematics where we find the leg angles qi given a known value for x, y, z, and theta were solved by Puro and company and presented in a paper in 2009. Unlike uh, your normal robot arm, solving the inverse kinematics for a parallel mechanism is actually quite straightforward. And you can see that when you look at this equation. Um, so for example, for the first leg where i equals one, we can observe with this equation that Q1 is exclusively in this one equation, which means we only have to solve one equation with a known value of x, y, and z to solve for Q1. However, the forward kinematics are much more complex because each of the four equations is dependent on x, y, z, and theta. Uh, I present the results of the forward kinematics in our paper. To briefly go over it, what we do is we can solve the, um, the values for the values of x, y, and z. And then this results in a polynomial expression, which we need to solve to get theta. However, this is an eighth order polynomial in theta. And uh, it's quite challenging to solve eighth order polynomials as the abel ruffini theorem states, there is no, in general, no explicit closed form algebraic solution for polynomials of degree five or higher. So we have to solve this polynomial using numerical methods um, such as Newton's root finding algorithm. However, having these forward kinematics is still quite useful if we choose to mount sensors to the board that or to the device that allow us to sense the uh, angular position of the device, of each of the legs of the device. However, because of the challenges in solving this in real time, we instead use the inverse kinematics for the control. We uh, take the desired position xd, we calculate, we use the inverse, inverse kinematics to calculate our desired leg angle, and then we have a PID controller for each of the legs, which um, allows us to achieve our desired leg, leg angle and our desired end effector position. With these kinematics, we're able to solve for the workspaces and forces in simulation. We find uh, the maximum movement of our actuator and that's displayed in this image of the workspace. So the workspace shown here, um, we have the X, Y, uh, the x, y, and z movement um, to all of the different possible locations in the workspace. And the color of each of the points represents the range of the, the rotational range of the device at that location. So what we can observe is that at the edges of the workspace, the device is not able to achieve its full rotation. In uh, actuality, we have an operational workspace where every point can achieve a plus minus 30 degree rotation, which is limited to a, uh, a rectangular prism in the center of its workspace that is eight by 10 by eight millimeters. We can calculate the, the forces that the device is able to apply 
to be a plus minus 1.5 newtons in the x and y direction, a normal force of two newtons, and then a torque of plus minus five newton meters. We perform bandwidth testing of the device and uh, we have the plots of that shown here. On the top, we have the magnitude and at the bottom, we have the phase. We have frequency going from 0.1 hertz to 15 hertz in a log scale. We notice that there's nonlinear behavior. Uh, there are multiple peaks in the magnitude response. We also see there are different cutoff frequencies and behavior for each of the degrees of freedom. The limiting degree to freedom is the Z degree of freedom, which has a negative 3D cut V cutoff at nine hertz. We use our device in two virtual re reality demonstrations to show its utility. The demonstrations were done in the chi 3 d virtual environment, which uses OpenGL to render uh, the space. What we have in this image is a virtual avatar, which represents the, the user's uh, location in space. The user's position is tracked in the real world with a magnetic tracker, and that corresponds to their virtual avatar's location. We calculate the forces of the interactions with the objects in the virtual environment uh, using Chai 3D. However, Chai does not have a method for creating or uh, representing the torsion forces. So we created a module to do this and the module uses the soft finger proxy algorithm. And this alg algorithm is capable of delivering or calculating both stretch and slip feedback, but we only rendered stretch. We, uh, this algorithm works by taking the initial contact angle alpha I, and then finding the current angle of the user alpha C as the finger changes position. And then we can calculate the torsion feedback tau using a spring model. Tau equals the spring stiffness, which is multiplied by uh, the change in angle of the user's position. We use a spring stiffness of nine Newton meters, which is uh, what was found in Barbogli and Company's paper in 2004 to match biomechanical models. So you saw this previous image of the user reaching down at the finger avatar and interacting with a uh, object. And the, when they did this, they reached down and they performed, um, they moved their finger back and forth receiving shear forces. And we can see the desired forces that are rendered to the user in this plot. We see that there is uh, X and Y shear forces that are oscillating as we expect. And then when the user lifts up their finger and then places their finger back down, uh, they twist it to the left and to the right and they get a uh, corresponding torsion force. We also see there's shear forces that the user is feeling during this interaction. Here is another uh, demonstration of the device in action. Uh, the user picks up a cube, uh, it rotates in their fingertips and they release it. In this case, we have um, um, no contact initially. The user initiates contact, which results in an increase in normal force. And uh, then as the user picks up the block, we see a ramp up in the amount of torsion that's delivered. And then as they have a stable grasp, all of the forces in each direction and the torques are steady until the user drops the cube and then no forces are rendered to them. Overall, my main contributions to this section, which are, were also done in collaboration with other researchers, was the characterization of the four degree of freedom device and the two demonstrations of the device in a virtual reality environment. In the future, there are several applications we're interested in investigating, including using this data-driven method to render haptic cues in multiple degrees of freedom. We're also interested in understanding how the origami parallel mechanism could be used and integrated with novel sensors and actuation in order to reduce its overall weight. We're interested in looking as well at how origami designs could be used to reduce friction and increase the overall rotational displacement of the end effector. We're able to achieve rotations of plus minus 30 degrees, but there's literature that indicates that larger rotations might be more compelling. We're also interested in using these origami manufacturing techniques to create and test 
various body mounted displays. Overall, throughout this presentation, I have talked to you about three different methods of increasing information content. We've discussed uh, looking at and increasing the number of contact points of stimulation, increasing the amount of information content using meaningful signals, and methods for creating multi-degree of freedom wearable devices for the fingertip. I'd like to thank all of my collaborators, I couldn't do it without you, um, and also my funding sources. I'd like to thank everybody on my committee. Um, Allison, thank you so much for being an amazing mentor and role model. I have enjoyed working with you so much. I've learned tons from you and I really appreciate all of the time um, that you've dedicated to my education. I'd also like to thank uh, Jonathan Fan and Gordon Whitestein for all that you guys have done. Um, thank you for being with me and sticking with me since my quals three years ago. I'm really excited that I got to tell you uh, more about what I've accomplished during my time here. Um, Mark, I've really enjoyed uh, working with you on that grant proposal with Ho Jung, um, and I'm excited where uh, origami and uh, your force sensing could uh, fuse and integrate. And Dr. Juan Rivas Davila, thank you so much for being here. Um, I don't know if you remember, but uh, the lunch that I went to with you in my first year um, really stuck with me. You're one of the first professors that I interacted with at Stanford. And I still remember you talking about um, how you worked in industry and then moved to academia. And um, I really appreciate the, the mentorship and the time that you, you take to contribute to, to the community. So thank you for being here. I also really love to thank uh, all of the lab. You are all so joyful and it makes it so amazing to come into work to, to interact with you and um, solve problems together. I've enjoyed so much being a part of this group. I'd also think, I'd like to thank all of my friends who have been here and um, supported me, brought me on wild adventures. I never thought I would see sunrise on Half Dome and I, I wouldn't have done it without you all being there. Um, so I love to, I, I thank you so much. I'd also love to thank my family. You all are just, I wouldn't be here without you. Um, my parents, uh, thank you for teaching me how to go on adventures um, and all of my family, your love and support is so meaningful to me. And I just wanna say, I love you. Um, thank you all for listening to me. Um, and I love to take any questions you have. Wonderful talk, Sophia. Everybody is doing the virtual quiet applause <laughs> thing. <laughs> um, so we have uh, plenty of time for questions. Um, you can put your questions into the, into the chat or just um, unmute yourself. I'm assuming, Sophia, you've given people the power to unmute themselves <laughs> if they'd yes. like to ask a question. So we'll have this public question session before we go to the closed session with the committee. First question is always the hardest, but we'll wait. I've got a question, Sophia. Go for it, Cleo. Um, when you were talking about like the second section, you'd considered six different emotions. Mm -hmm. I was wondering if you based all of those off of previous research or if there were other emotions that you considered, like. I feel like, je like jealousy or anger could have been quite strong as well. Did either mm -hmm. of those or any other emotions come up in your brainstorming? And why did you not choose to add different ones in? Yeah, I think- uh, Sorry I think to that, interrupt, but if you could briefly restate the question for the captioning, that would be fantastic. Okay, we will do. Um, so the question is, uh, do we consider other emotions and what sorts of considerations did we have? Uh, did it, was it based on previous research? So I think it was, um, I think there are two different layers to this. One was we did consider the different research, what emotions had, be considered, had been considered in the past. We wanted a diversity of emotions um, so that we were able to uh, encompass and have ones that were differentiable. Um, 
However, we also were working collaboration with Facebook Reality Labs and some of the emotions that we selected were ones that they were the most interested in being able to convey. Cool, thanks and a wonderful presentation. It was really, really well laid out. Thank you, Cleo. Love any other questions people have. Definitely have time for a couple more. Hi, Sophia. Um, great talk. Um, I had a question about the, the solving the kinematics. Mm -hmm. So you solved the forward kinematics, um, and yet the inverse kinematics were easier to implement for control. Um, mm -hmm. I guess I don't really have a good sense of that difference. Like how hard would it have been to try the forward kinematics? Yeah, so um, the question was, uh, you used the, the inverse kinematics for the control, um, and uh, Nate is asking um, how difficult would it have been to use the forward kinematics instead? So um, I think to solve the polynomial, since you have to use numerical methods, there is going to be a, um, there's going to be a delay in terms of your update rate. And one thing that we require with haptics is that we want a very fast update rate in order to be able to render and control the motors um, such that we have a uh, stability in our device. And so we really do need a fast update rate. And part of that comes with being able to compute our end effector, our desired end effector position and our desired joint angles quickly. Um, so I think just the delay in the computation using numerical methods would limit that. However, it is very useful for different applications. So for example, um, if we chose to mount uh, different sensors to the device that allow us to get a, a measurement of the angle of the, the device and of all the legs, we can use the forward kinematics to first find the actual end effector position and then use the inverse kinematics after that. And this is really nice because one thing that I noticed while working with this device is you have to estimate initially what the, um, the actual initial position is of the end effector. Um, and then once you do that, you control around the end effector position after that initial estimate. But any errors in that um, can lead to errors in the overall tracking of the device. So having both uh, um, the forward kinematics and the inverse kinematics can be useful uh, if you can add onboard sensing. Thank you, that really clarified. Great, thanks for those answers, Sophia. We might have time for one more question. Ho-Jung, I see you unmuting. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, I, I had a small question on the first section. Can you maybe mm -hmm. go back to page 19 and 20 of your presentation? Yep. This might take a while. <laughs> <laughs> or it might have been page 20. But um, yeah, I was wondering why uh, the information transfer saturates as the number of signal increases? Is it because of human cognitive capacity? It's hard to remember all that information or were there other reasons? Yeah, so um, it tends to be that uh, as you increase the amount of signals, uh, there is this cognitive capacity of the user. And there's also uh, with different signals, you're going to get a different amount of information you're able to transfer. So if the signals are too similar, um, then it will become more challenging. Oh, um, also just to repeat the question, um, the question was uh, as, uh, why does the information transfer saturate as we increase the number of signals? Um, so one of the reasons is uh, the capacity of humans and one is how differentiable the signals are. Um, and one thing you can think of with these particular signals is that since they're pulses, 
uh, to increase the number of signals, we have to increase the number of pulses. Uh, and this becomes a, a counting problem. Um, and there's various research on numerosity or this counting problem um, that indicates that uh, it becomes more challenging uh, the number of signals that you have. So there's previous research that also validates this concept that there exists a plateau where we're no longer able to uh, communicate more information. Another way you could think of it is um, in, in this, uh, so in this previous image, we see that the accuracy of the user is decreasing. And since these, this accuracy is decreasing as we increase the number of signals, that trend will uh, continue. And once the accuracy is low enough, um, we're no longer able to communicate more information. Thank hey. you for answering my question. Terrific. Thanks for, for those questions. Um, maybe with the permission of uh, Juan Rivas de Vila, who is the chair, um, if you agree, Juan, we can close the public session. Sounds good. Thanks, everyone, too, for, for attending. Uh, wonderful job, Sophia. And then the committee and Sophia will now go to a different private <laughs> Zoom room uh, in order to, to do our questions. Thanks, everyone, for coming. And thanks for all your nice comments in the chat. Thank you. Thank you, everyone.